Greetings from Sir Early. We're going to take a look today at um, the historic Soul City. Soul City um, is a little town in um, North Carolina um, that sits in Warren County. Um, I currently reside here. I've been living here for the past 13 years. And it's a whole lot of um, historic meaning behind Soul City that others didn't know about. So I'm going to be sharing with you all, you know. On 1,800 acres of land in rural eastern North Carolina, which he named Soul City. McKissick lived in Soul City until his death in 1991. Black people want to have the choice to live where they want to. Negro leader today announced plans for creation of a black-built, black-owned town to be called Soul City in North Carolina. In this new town, persons will be able to control their own destinies. Seeing this whole thing being transformed was the most liberating thing I've ever experienced in my lifetime. Affordable housing, people were going to get jobs. That's what made sense back then. We thought we had a very good plan in place. The question then was how we could execute any of it. Even as President Nixon on down, we were trying to make a case that they were very supportive. On the ground, we didn't have the dollars. There was a discomfort level for many people who were not African American. I mean, let's be real. The boss is a black guy. Senator Helms responded saying, one of my first acts is going to be to try to close you down. I can't help but think that that's politically motivated and possibly racially motivated. We're here. We did it. Stop talking about it. This is going to work. The city's coming. In this new town, persons will be able to control their own destinies. Floyd McKissick left Harlem to create his vision of black power in the rural South. Affordable housing, health care, people were going to get jobs. We thought we had a very good plan in place. The question then was how we could execute any of it. Building is empowering. I want to be a part of building something new. That was the dream for me, to be a piece of this, because we wanted to be transformed. But not everyone supported the radical project. Senator Helms responded, one of my first acts is going to be to try to close you down. I mean, let's be real. The boss is a black guy. There are some folk who don't believe that a black man could do it or should be doing it. along the same line. By the 1670s, European traders carried gunpowder, shot and guns, iron tools and kettles, blankets, and brass, copper, and glass beads into the wilderness of North Carolina. 
with horse trains numbering into the hundreds, each packed with goods. All that remains of the ancient trail are the modern highways and many historical markers, including the marker on US-1 in Norlina, erected in 1941 to preserve the memory of the ancient Indian trading passage. Uh, rail transportation began in Warren County in 1840 upon the completion of the Raleigh and Gaston Railroad. Warrington was a proposed location for the railroad, but the townspeople rejected it. And the reason it was chosen as a possible location is because it was the largest town between, between Raleigh and Gaston. Later, the townspeople regretted their decision and a short line railroad was put between Warren Plains and Warrington and it was three miles long and it was supposedly the shortest full gauge railroad in the world. Upon the completion of the Raleigh Gaston Railroad in the next few decades, train depots were put in Macon, Warren Plains, Ridgeway, and Manson. Uh, well, Dr. Hawkins, after he graduated from medical school in 1845, purchased a tract of land and built, uh, started building his uh, estate or uh, in Ridgeway, uh, adjacent to the railroad tracks, because uh, he saw the importance of the railroad and knew that uh, he wanted to be part of it. And eventually he did become a very important part of it. My first memory of the train was when I was going to Ridgeway School and they had the first steam engine came through and the school closed and took all of the railroad to, to the highway to see the train go through. And that little train, at that time, we could catch us and go to Manson, wherever, and stop anywhere, just like a bus. My father, uh, father was a sharecropper. And when they start the railroads through Warren County, or through North Carolina, they got jobs. My father quit work on the farm at age 12 and started working for the Seaboard Railway. He had five sons all together. And all five sons worked for the railway. Um, one was an engineer. Uh, one was a cook, a chef, and two were bridgemen. And they all retired except one uncle, the one is a chef. Rapidly, Norlina began to grow. New commercial businesses popped up near the railroad line, and. In 1913, the town was incorporated. In the 1920s, US-1 was completed through Warren County, and this put a new boom into New Orleans area because now commercial businesses were built along the new highway of US-1 along with a new hotel. The railroad continued to boom in North Carolina until after World War II. By World War II, North Carolina was a very busy depot because there was dozens of troop trains going through the town every day. At this time, North Carolina had a freight yard, switcher engines, and a round table. After World War II, the railroads all over the country began to decline, including the ones going through New Orleans. By the 1950s, New Orleans has a devastating blow because the switching yard is changed from New Orleans to Raleigh. I was coming from California in 47, and from California to Chicago was it was integrated. Then when we got to Chicago, we saw a little change. When we got to Washington, D.C., it was a total change. Absolutely. And when we got to, to Washington, the only thing the conductor would say, okay, look at the ticket. He said, track one, car five. If a white person come up, he said, track one, car six, or something like that. Uh, of course, we sat generally one car behind the mail car. And we caught all the six and the debris from the engine, that's when they had the uh, 
coal fire engine. The conductor, which always was white, he would get out with a stool at the white car. The porter would get out at the, uh, with a stool where the black people live. And then the conductor would get the tickets in the white car, and then the porter would come in and say, get your tickets ready, get your tickets ready. And then the conductor would come through the black car. Mi gente, esto es súper importante, ¿ok? Claro, Zuna, pero asegúrate de tener buena señal, ¿ok? Tranquilo, tengo Spectrum Mobile, es más confiable. Y con 5G a nivel nacional, estoy siempre conectado. ¿Qué te parece la decoración? Tan nítido. Este blazer tiene swagger. Brutal. ¿Estás listo, Zuna? Sí, llama. Por fin soy mamá. Wow, amiga. Qué emoción. Para momentos como estos, confía en Spectrum Mobile. El servicio más confiable. In the 1960s, New Orleans takes a devastating blow because Interstate 85 is completed. This means the heavy volume of traffic that was on US-1 was diverted to the new interstate, so commercial businesses along that highway started a slow decline, including the service stations, hotel, and other commercial businesses. The black man thought that he could go to the city and would be accepted with open arms because the slogan has been go north. This is where the opportunities were. So he left the farming area and he went north and he found that if he went there in a great in great numbers that the white people really didn't want it. And actually the white people moved out to the suburb and now the cities have become all black. And so black people have been running and chasing whites from one locality to the other. I think it's time that we quit chasing white, quit trying to be like white, come right back to the land where we started from and really start building and build an economy. We can build an economy on this land. It looks as if it's business as usual in the old south. A plantation, a decaying old mansion, harvesting time in the tobacco fields. But now there's a difference. Amid these reminders of another age, there is a drastic change underway on this land. This is to be the site of a bold new experiment. On this property, formerly a plantation, a new city will rise. A city inspired and controlled by blacks. It is Soul City, situated in Warren County, North Carolina. The guiding light behind the project is Floyd McKissick, well known nationally for his years of struggle in the civil rights movement. As far as you can see around here, we own. This is where Soul City will rise into its own. Right now, we got a population of 56 people. We started off in January with one. In about 17 years, 50,000 people will live in this town and we'll have industry, medical services, we'll have anything comparable to what other cities have without the manifest problems that the major metropolitan areas have today. The truth of the matter is the problem starts here and the problem is merely identified by a process of migration to the big urban centers in New York, Boston, Chicago, and etc. But this is the highest point of migration in North Carolina to the city. And until we say, look, we're going to start solving the problem here, then we'll never solve the problem in the city. In December of 1969, Floyd McKissick Sr., former national civil rights leader and attorney, bought over 5,000 acres of land for Seoul City, of which he became the founder and developer. Seoul City, funded by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, was designed to promote self-help, empowerment, and community economic development. Its centralized location was ideal, halfway between New York and Atlanta, only a couple of miles from Interstate 85, 
and the Seaboard Coastline Railroad ran through the property. The area currently houses the largest employee in Warren County. Yeah, I man. Yeah, this is this is where actually where I reside at. So if y'all go to um some of my videos on my channel, the little videos I be showing um that's the area here, and I actually um actually where he uh standing doing all the talking and stuff at is actually um the house where I um do the yard work and shit at um every two weeks and shit. I keep the yard maintenance and shit like that. Um, so y'all go to my old videos and shit, not old, but, um, previous videos and shit. And y'all see how, um, Soul City currently looks now. And, um, if it won't for, for, um, Republican, um, Jesse Hams and shit, he was a Senator. He was racist and shit, man. But if it won't for him, him, man, this community will be big as hell. Yo, far as like, it's big, but I'm talking about far as like businesses and shit like that. So we actually is, um, we probably like 25 minutes from, um, the Virginia line. You get what I'm saying? And, um, we probably 35 minutes um, north of Riley and Durham. You get what I'm saying? So I'm going to show y'all some more um, videos and shit about Soul City and stuff. But the guy y'all was seeing, he actually marched with um, Martin Luther King and all of that shit too. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. Clear enough for you. All right. <laughs> yeah. My niggas look mad. Y'all right. supposed to be happy on the street. Y'all niggas look like y'all wanted me to stay in jail. <laughs> Picture me rolling in my 500 bins. I got no love for these niggas. There's no need to be friends. They got me under surveillance. I swear somebody can tell it. No, there's no being so. But I ain't gonna tell it. Don't wanna be another number. I got a fucking gang and we can keep you going under. The federalists wanna see me dead. Niggas put practice on my head. Now I got two drop dollars by my bed. I beat them lead. Now I'm released. How will I live? Well, God forgive me for all the dirt a nigga did. Be kids. One life to live. It's so hard to be positive. When niggas shooting at your grip. Mama, I'm still stuck in the world of support. Zone. My homies is in, mate, and most of them dead grown. Full grown, following your man. The semen on ways to put some penis on the palms of my empty hand. Just picture me rolling, crossing the beans on the ranch that isn't stolen. My dreams are sensing, my hopes are pouring. I'm like a bean and finally see on the dope is gone. My nerves are wrecked, heart beating in my head to smoke. Thinking of the cheese, I'll be hoping. Picture me rolling. 
Can you see me now? Move to the side a little bit so you can get a clear picture. Can you see it? Picture me bro. Yeah, nigga. Hey, but people, my nigga, suck, dude. Guess who's back? I got keys coming from overseas. Cost a nigga 200 G's. I'm a street commando, need no, for example. This lavish lifestyle is hard to handle, so I got the boss, cause I'm more like a boss player. Thug ready to be a woman layer. So many player haters imitate a steady swaying. Make me wanna start back banging. So I'm caught up in the game. Press code change. Pack it 40 glass to tame or rearrange. All that jealousy and Yo, salute, salute. Just showing y'all a little bit of Soul City. It's um historic. I currently currently reside here. <laughs> Been living here the past 13 years.
Lauren salute. Yami salute. men and women who found strength in numbers to ensure that African-American children received a quality education, whether they're negotiating for a longer school term or they're negotiating for textbooks that present African-Americans in a positive light, they found ways to improve educational opportunities for black youth. The Hammers was the answer to a prayer of a uh, recreational facility, uh, a waterfront and all that, that we could develop and enjoy God's gift of the skies, the seas, and the animal life. By 1950, the transfer of the property to the North Carolina Teachers Association was finalized. The hammocks also provide an ideal meeting place for members to share ideas and strategies for the looming civil rights struggles that lay ahead. We met at the Hammers with large groups of teachers. That was when we were trying to get everybody on board with the busing. We had workshops at the Hammers Beach where teachers were trained not only in the integration of school methods, but we had to train teachers how to now work with their counterparts from the other race. Sidney Wilhelm is an American sociologist who believes that the Negro has been wasting his energy. Professor Wilhelm has a profoundly harsh and pessimistic view of his country's past and present and future, black or white. He believes that there has been no black revolution, only a white revolution, and it was a technological one, and a black man is its first victim. Its first victim because America is racist and white. America has a history of racism that began when the first pilgrims landed. Wilhelm writes that as European settlers first claimed the homesteads in America, the Indian was driven off his land. He was considered pagan, an inferior being. As the settler economy developed and shifted to plantation farming, cheap field labor was needed. But the Indian couldn't be enslaved to the settler economy, so he was killed or put on reservations. <laughs> Black Africans kidnapped and sold into slavery could be put to work for no more than the price of keeping them alive. In addition to this economic exploitation, the Negro was a victim of racism. Bolstered by his Christianity, the white man developed a set of attitudes that saw the black man as subhuman. God and nature had given the white man brains and the black man brawn. <laughs> Plantation nigger knew his place, said Wilhelm. His station in life was clearly defined by the white man. But this security became undermined by a threat from the North. An economy of cotton was losing the battle against an economy of factories. When victory was assured and the plantation battered, a black man came North, hoping to escape Southern racism and find a place in the new economy. But the Negro found he wasn't needed, that he was only useful on the fringes of the economy, to be a street sweeper or houseboy for white society. The black man was forced into old and undesirable parts of the cities, creating ghettos. 
whites moved out to the suburbs. In the South, the black man had had a place and a function. In the North, says Willem, he had neither. Rejected by white America, the Negro searched for a new identity. He began looking to the culture and religions of Africa, the place of his ancestry. He stopped wanting to be light-skinned. He adopted the slogan, Black is Beautiful. He started the Civil Rights Movement. He attempted to end the racism of white America. And white America responded. The myth of superiority was replaced by the myth of equality, says Wilhelm. A white man passed legislation and made court decisions giving the Negro full equality before the law. But for Wilhelm, the myth of equality only perpetuates American racism. For it allows the white man to say that if blacks are still discontented, if they're still poor and unemployed and living in slums, there is now no legal barrier to stop them from becoming a success. Just like all other Americans, the Negro's on his own. But now the industrial economy is giving way to the automated society. And those jobs that the white man has given to the northern blacks are being taken over by machines. More and more Negroes are unemployed. More and more whites are leaving the cities. The ghetto becomes isolated. It's mood angrier. Sit-ins give way to riots. Hiding comfortably behind the myth of equality, Wilhelm says, white America is arming itself, preparing for a violent response to a violent demand. The seeds have been sown for the extermination of the American Negro. Floyd McKissick is one of America's most influential black spokesmen. Until last summer, he was the chairman of the Congress of Racial Equality Corps. But now he's busy putting into practice some of the theories that Wilhelm has expounded. He, he agrees with Wilhelm that there's no future place in America for the black man. Like Wilhelm, he argues that Negro's future lies in economic independence of the white man, not in integration. But McKissick believes that the Negro can use his rejection by white America to his own advantage. The black man really is not destined to increasing misery, a growing threat to his very existence. So McKissick is building something called Soul City, 1,800 acres of land in one of the poorest regions of the United States, North Carolina's Warren County. And here they're going to build plants, develop service industries, construct modern housing. It'll be a sort of model city of the automated age, and it's going to be built and operated by black people. Most of us have been very sympathetic to the struggle of the American Negro for equality in his own land, and I guess we have tended to share the hope and maybe the belief that the future of the United States is going to be an integrated one. But both McKissick and Willem say that we're wrong. John Saywell and I talked to these two men last week. Today, Wilhelm, in his book, is really saying what racism is and how racist white people are and to the extent right. that they are about to go. Therefore, what are we fighting for? Black people are now fighting for survival. You see, one of the things that the white man does, he forces a man up into a corner. I'll never forget when I was a kid one time. And I was forced in a corner by two, by two cats. One had a knife and the other had a brick. And I had to figure out a strategy to win. I had to get out of that or else I would be wasted. So I had to fight both of them. So I had to use one for the shield. The one that was the dangerous one was the knife. So I had to hide behind the other with the brick because I knew if I got hit with the brick, that the chance is living. So I tackled the guy with the brick and threw him into the guy with the knife and then ran like hell. And this is the position that you're forcing a black man in today. You're exactly. And the white, man is going to, the white man is going forever to keep you running. And yet, He's and never going to let up. And we can, you can never be assured, let up. You, you can be assured, He's never going to let up. be assured that there comes a stopping point after man runs. There will never be a stopping point until he faces a black man on the equivalent of an Indian reservation. And that the restless Negro turns into the listless Indian. When that is achieved, he'll you'll have happy. a white man off your back. And, he'll, and the That's white right. man will be happy. But the Negro will, will be miserable. He'll be living like the Indian to die. And you, you see, now, you this is a that? white man. This is a white yes. man who's really running some facts to you about your white psyche. About this is what true. this thing's all about. He's really running a point. This is the point I've been running in genocide. I just completed a book for, for Mac Miller, Three-Fifths of a Man. 
which is due out next month. Now, this is a white man who's telling you, man, y'all sick upstairs. I have now reached the point to believe that the man, you can tell him what is wrong. He knows what's right and what's wrong. He knows that he's exploiting you. He knows that he's not letting you have a chance to live in the house. He knows that he's not going to let you have a chance to get this job. He knows he is wrong. And yet, he, if you tell him that he's wrong, he'll say, yeah, I know it. But you must understand, I don't have the capacity to change. And please don't aggravate me because I might kill you in the process. Even though I'm wrong, I might be forced to kill you. This is the white man today. If you don't want me, brother, okay. You got a cake over here. You built your cake and you put your glass wall three inches around it. I help you build that cake. And this is what black militants say. We help build this cake. We are forced to look at that cake day after day and wish we had a slice of it. Is the way to equality through segregation, as Mr. Wilhelm is arguing. Equality and as is you, establishing as, as segregation. But it's not a question of integration or segregation. White people have a choice to go where they want to go. Right. If you I don't. own a neighborhood and I've got a restaurant down there, you come in and you can eat. But the whites are saying the same thing. Now, this is what we have no. to explore. Now, the no. whites are saying exactly the same thing to you. They are practicing equality. But they are. Now, let me, yes, now, let me just explain. Now, they are practicing equality. But the forceful implementation of that equality is bringing about racial separation. See? No. Now, if, for example, the white says, I'm going to judge you as I would any man regardless of color, what's going to happen to the Negro? He's going to be separated from the white. Because if you say, now, look, if you want to buy a house, you have to have so much down payment. Well, if you don't have it, and most Negroes don't have it, then you have to live where? In the slums. So the white can say, well, you see, I'm not forcing you to live in the slums because you're black. I'm forcing you, you're living in the slums because all men are equal. We're judging you not by your color, but by your economic oh, consideration. Yeah, so but just, wait a minute. Yeah. But you see, and what I'm trying to say, my difference is that, that they really aren't being equal. Thank they are saying that well, as a method to hide well, the real desire of course. to exterminate. If you've got a door that says exit, that door means exit for all people. If all of us went out of that door, how come I'm an integrationist or how come I'm a segregationist if I go out that door? If you got a bus running down the street and it's a bus for all people and I get on that bus, I'm not an integrationist or a separationist. I'm a citizen. And that's the basis upon which I predicate the rights. Yeah, but let me ask you both. Is there any way for black Americans and white Americans to walk through those doors together and to ride on those buses together? and to climb into the executive suites together, or are, I mean, you sound to be an absolute pessimist. You seem to me, when you're talking about the future of black Americans, to be optimistic. But what about black Americans and white Americans together? Uh, frankly, we got a solution. We've tried to offer one. We're building a town called Soul City in North Carolina, a town that's going to afford black people job opportunities, 20 such jobs, as one center plan, as one city planner has indicated, that never have been available to black people before. And these 20 areas of job classification have never been open to them in the North or in the South. Does Sidney Wilhelm think that that is going to lead to black Americans and white Americans doing well, something together? It depends upon the nature together. of the city itself. Technically, as our understanding, it's open to people of all races. That's correct. But if it's open to people of all races, then it's just going to be like another city. On the other hand, if in effect, even though it's open, but the result brings about a concentration of black people, then this will be exactly what whites would prefer. I'll say that there are some people who will say, well, praise God that the niggas are leaving this area now and getting on over there. As one guy from the Ku Klux Klan says, uh, I, if, if this is satisfied niggas, I'd rather give them one. That's Can't right. That's yeah, right. one of them That's said right. that. With, with the full statement. anticipation that it will... Yeah. Keep not only the Negro in his place, but it would not become an economic competitor to the white. Yeah. What we want to do is to make Soul City a place where black people can come and know that they want it. That is going to be very splendid. It's playing to the hands of the white man's notion that today what we need is not separate but equal rights, but equal in order to have separate rights. This is the theme of white society. Dr. Wilhelm is saying that your soul city is going to turn into a reservation. All I'm asking Dr. Wilhelm is what alternatives are there? Well, that's what I'd like to ask him because I'm that's asking, the one thing I'm I can't find in your book. I'm asking to give me an alternative. You're not give going to find it in that book either. My, the purpose of that book, the book uh, Who Needs the Negro, 
the intent of it is to set forth what is taking place, what is emerging. It's not a definitive formulation of a resolution. And that would just have to wait for another day, gentlemen. If by going into Soul City that we develop sufficient power, sufficient political power, sufficient economic power, then by having that power, we may be able to accomplish many of the things that we cannot accomplish in a so-called integrated society. But you must remember, we don't have anything in an integrated society because those are mere this, words. That's right. And this is the that's reason right. that you go right. into a society, into this other society, the nationalistic society, which you really forced to go into to survive. Uh, uh, that you are trying to accomplish. You will come out ultimately accomplishing more. Now, it's one thing that Wilhelm has said. He said, this is what white people want. The white man isn't going to let you alone. American society would not leave a country 10,000 miles away. That's alone. right. In Vietnam. He, that's right. In Vietnam. And he takes that white man over there with him. That's right. And uses him. That's right. To do now, if he's going to use the black man to do his dirty work 10,000 miles of what? You know he'll do it at home. You better believe it. <laughs> see, I know I cannot see any escape from it. <clears throat> would you, given the way you've developed your thesis, would you discourage Mr. McKissick from developing so I wouldn't discourage any black man from doing anything. I would try to understand it. I cannot sit back and condemn. I just can't. He's been condemned too much. All that I can say is that best evidence at hand to indicate the general patterns that we've been speaking of. I can't hold out at this moment any certain hope, regardless of whatever he might undertake. So the result, regardless again of what he might wish, is going to be the same because whites will never allow it. Soul City in any way to intimidate its command. Why would it be necessary to ask is what Mr. McKissie is doing? Don't white people own and control all of the other cities in this country except four or five small communities anyway? And why is the world getting all excited about whether what I'm doing is really for the good or for the worse? This would be the first city that black people created, you know what I mean? And whoever complained about all of the cities that the white people already own and have already created. This is pure racism to make it an issue. Are you saying seriously to me that I'm a racist because I asked that question? I'm saying that the, 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 the way it's phrased, whether you are a racist or not, I'm saying the fact that we think like that. You see, racism has a funny thing. It can be very positive directly or indirectly, and we don't even know we're doing it. It's just like a guy sees me walking down the street, white people come around, uh, uh, say there, you jolly old fellow, such such a thing. And the minute I walk up, it's, hey, boy. I mean, it's, it's just, and it's pure racism, not because he really wanted to say it, but this is the way it is. It's embedded. This is the way the society runs. You're saying it really works because it's unconscious, right? That's right. That's when it's most effective. Yes, yeah. very effective. And that if you become aware of it, then you have a chance to deal with it. That's right. Look like you would all say, look, that's good that black people now start building their towns. Since they constitute somewhere around so many people, let's see that they, 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 they have about 20 more towns, and maybe that helps solve our problem. <laughs> but the white man wants to put the finger on you because that way it takes the finger off of him. Right. See? Yeah. See, because again, you see, he can take the blame off of his own shoulder, put it on your back as a burden, you see, that you have to carry in addition to trying to establish your city. Well, I, I, there are two or three things I'd like to say on that. One is that in your analysis of the Vietnam situation, one must also underscore the point that the reason that ultimately when your so-called equality in parentheses is practiced, and you find that black people don't have the education that white people have, and therefore black kids are put into combat. That is because of the racism which was practiced previously. That's right. When they didn't have That's right. the opportunity to go. That's right. 
Uh, so this is perfect agreed uh, and understood and now not let us questioned. go let us go further let us go, ahead, go let, further. let him see okay okay go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. well i would like to ask you if and i'm not it's not my analysis of vietnam it's his analysis of vietnam and of the new book i'm i'm just attempting to find out why there isn't a solution because i think you have a solution uh take the revolt on campus take the war in vietnam take your own analysis of uh, what's the use of the Negro and then other groups in society, all of which relates to a social structure that you as a sociologist know all about, have elaborated, have studied, and it's implicit in your book. It's a society that values profit accumulation, social hierarchy, and efficiency over everything else. Yes. And you mean to tell me that having come to that conclusion and seeing all these problems, you don't and are not prepared to recommend a solution? Not at this juncture. I would say this. Are you prepared? Do you see a solution? Is, is his analysis is that? The Eldridge Cleaver sees a solution. Well, if you want to, yes, in certain sense. If you want to look at it in one sense, of course. Which is a solution to all those problems and not just the Negro. Let me put it this way. If these are the causes, and if we agree that these are fundamental features, Get rid of them, we will require a revolution. Thank you. Yes, sir. Is, is that the answer that, that I was, you want? I was, I was sort of. I don't think that I thought, I thought that that was quite obvious. I mean, this is the road that you headed down. I don't think it really requires a man with any degree of brilliance to ascertain that we're just running in that direction at about 500 miles an hour on the ground. Really, there is no choice. And when you have no choice, you can only react either in one or several ways. Be extremely passive and accept your fate, or we fall against it. And this is what America is going to have to cope with. Extremely rebellious minority, and the Negro then is going to have to face the sincere and genuine possibility of being a white genocide. And you're talking about, and the, and, the, and the people who are killed now among black people are those who have the courage, the leadership, and the guts to stand up and fight. You, what they've really done is attempt to emasculate all black leadership in this country, unless it was highly uh, uh, culturalized or sophisticated leadership which just tended towards being a preacher or uh, a teacher. Or uh, Booker T. Washington. Uh, Booker T. Washington. How about a Martin King? This is interesting if you want to talk about his assassination. So if you want to move into that, I think it's a rather interesting phenomenon. In my judgment, you see, a person like Martin Luther King was very much of a threat, more of a threat than a Carmichael. Because Carmichael had the rhetoric, but Martin Luther King had the following. And this is something that American society would not tolerate, a black man advocating economic reform any massive following that he has. Boy, McKissick, if he gets his soul city going, is going to be a black man intending economic reform with a large following, or at least a large band of companions. Are you saying that Floyd McKissick if is a potential target for economic? If he becomes a threat to the economy of American society, to any scheme, his chances for survival become minimum. And I wouldn't take out an insurance policy. Well, he's opting out. Are you, are, are, are you thinking about that? Well, you see, I, I, don't, I don't even think you have to really go to the point where you are. Uh, I think anyone that's out here uh, in the struggle is exposed that threats come, period. They've already had such threats. It's not new to the Negro in general. I mean, uh, many Negroes with no national reputation have been eliminated externally. America is a very violent country. It takes its violence not only upon the Negro, but upon its own white people. And then it takes it thousands of miles away. Part of our heritage. It's all likely it'll be a continuation of our heritage. Racism is just another manifestation of that violence. Many a day that a kid laid down and, and says, I'll I'll, I'll let you stomp me and hit me, but he knew he had to go through that to get the sympathy of some whites in this country. And he got a few people sympathetic. Not all of them. Many of them said, stomp the nigga again. Don't stop. You know, 
but he got a little bit of sympathy, but the nonviolence doctrine is only a racist doctrine in the last analysis. That doctrine is, even though I beat, hit, kick, slap you, you are not supposed to hit me back because I am white. That's right. And when you strike back, then I'll call out my machine guns and my National Guard, and I'll level your ghetto. This is true. And the ghettos are already there. It doesn't make no difference whether we build Soul City and make it all black or white in the last analysis, because he's ready right now. If he could drop the A-bomb on Harlem without hurting, you know, down below the park and up above in the suburb, he'd do it. But now they're talking about don't let them niggas get separate because they may get their own thing over there. You know. It's a whole lot of talk. As you speak of your country, you speak of it with a great deal of bitterness. Do you consider yourself to be a patriot? Well, I so like to place myself on a motto that Marcus Garvey once said. <laughs> Let justice be done to all mankind. And it's in terms of that that I speak, not as a citizen, not necessarily as a person, but a person with that principle in mind. And I would like to see not only whites practice this, but I would like to see peoples and nations practice this, not as just mere rhetoric, but as a very fundamental internal principle to be in practice. And that's what disturbs me, because we are far from that. And that's what I would like to see achieved. Not equality, justice. You know, it's odd that you would say you speak of your country in bitterness. Uh, what you should say, you speak of your country in truth with Very results good. and a better sound. It would be far more accurate. I've got four kids, and I love my kids, and I hate to have to spank one of them when I spank them. I have to tell them the truth. And if my country is wrong, uh, then I have to say my country is wrong. And this is very important, that white America doesn't know the truth with regard to the Negro. And they just doesn't know. The isolation is so acute that there's greater likelihood of whites and blacks not seeing one another. Today, they're in slavery and having interaction with one another is far less today than it was in the period of slavery. That's how cute it is. That's how severe the isolation is. 95% of America's suburbs are white. 95% white. They don't come into contact with blacks. How are they going to understand them? They're not taught in the schools, not in the police, not in the They don't learn in their daily lives. They don't see it on TV. They read and see on TV only black violence coming before them. Not white violence, and there are black violence. So what can they think of a man when they see him today, when they come across a black man? Oh, there's a violent man. Where's my policeman? And you have to remember, what the police chief of Los Angeles said during that riot. They're like monkeys. They're like monkeys. They're like monkeys. And what Ronald Reagan, governor then, said, do you remember what he said? They're madmen. They're mad dogs. That's what he said. Mad dogs. Now, with monkeys, you put them in cage. And with mad dogs, you shoot them down. And that's America's definition of black men today. That's white America. And he's going to act upon that definition. And you know, an interesting part about it, he feels compelled to do so. Right. The, the, the tragic thing about all of this is that when you talk about, you see kids get up and singing a song, America, yes. America, yes. and the star spang banner and the yes. flag waving That's high right. and on a half mass at Kennedy's death and all of these things. These are the only times that we really... Uh, pay homage or attempt to pay homage to a series of principles that we stomp every day. And the second tragedy of it is that every black man, what any black man is in this country, I don't care whether he's Stokely and Rap King or anybody, this country made him that way. 
They made him that way, and I can understand it. Very simply, very cogently, and very easily. Very Any man here, you can't slap a man, stomp him every day, and then look at him, quit stomping him one day, and say, love me. I, uh, 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 that you, you got to love me. You can't pull that on and expect that guy to say, I love you in return. That's, it's, it's not asking a man to be human. And this is what the country breeds by its action and its interaction day by day, and it continues day by day. The words of uh, Buffy St. Marie in that great song, My country, tis of thy people, of your dying. Yeah, appreciate you again, Yami, for real, for real. Hey, look, sometime today, I'm going to let y'all get a look of how things um look nowadays. And the house that he was standing at, like doing all that speaking and talking from, I actually be cutting that grass and stuff. So I'm going to show y'all the whole area, you get what I'm saying, of how it looks today. Sometime today, as y'all know, what it's 90 degrees right now, and we almost at three o'clock p.m. So that shit gonna be <laughs> once it cool off and shit. Yeah, man. But for real, I appreciate you, yummy man, for them indulging and making comments and tuning in and stuff. Um, like I said, be on the lookout later for how things look nowadays in Soul City. Fuck with me though, Yami. For real, for real. <laughs> 